You are a worthless street rat. You were born a street rat. You'll die a street rat. And only your fleas will mourn you. The 3.8.4 Stellaris Gemini patch has just been released. We have the full patch notes. We're going to go through and break down everything that's changing in Stellaris. We're going to be looking at the way they've rebalanced living standards, which is going to have a massive impact on factions and unity generation. And I believe this rebalance is something of a nerf to non-machine, non-hive mind empires. They've also reworked some of the leader traits, moving them into council traits, either to reduce micromanagement, i.e. if you had to move a governor from planet to planet to maximize the benefit of some trait, or to address undesired stacking issues. For example, if you're stacking ship build cost reduction to get it to a lovely minus 90%. At the end of the video, there's a special announcement by the developers about something happening next weekend. And just after that, I have an announcement about something happening tomorrow on Friday, the 16th of June. So stick around to find out all of that and more. But without any further ado, let's dive in and find out what's going on. Right at the start with the balance changes. So they've rebalanced yet again a number of leader traits some general and governor traits that previously encouraged moving leaders from planet to planet have been made into counselor traits or have had their modifiers changed to discourage this sort of movement. Also, resource production traits now require the leader to have at least level two to gain the first tier. What does this mean? Well, basically shipwright and retired fleet officer are now council traits rather than traits that only apply to the specific star base that you have a governor in. Now this actually makes it more difficult to stack that ship build cost reduction because previously you could have something like military pioneer, have lots of admirals with that sort of thing on your council, stacking minus 10% bonuses, and then get a system with three or four, however many governors you could fit, you probably have to build some habitats or just get lucky with the RNG, put three or four governors on that system, put them there with shipwright, and if you're really lucky, retired fleet officer, and that would allow you to stack 10 to 20% per governor on top of the already large 30 to 40% you are getting from your council. Now, however, you'll only be able to choose between admirals with that minus 10% or, or slightly higher bonuses and governors with minus 10% bonuses going onto your council. So this will make it harder to get to that lovely maximum minus 90% ship build cost, but it will make it easier to get the first levels of reduction and it does reduce micromanagement. We can now have this reduction in ship build cost empire wide from those governor traits. Forcing resource production traits to require your leader being at least level two, meaning I assume you can't get it until level three, though this could mean you can get it at level two. If it is at level two, that probably won't make much difference to the game other than the fact that you won't be able to roll initially any leaders with resource traits right out of the gate. That is of course unless you have vaults of knowledge or the equivalent civic making all of your leaders start at level 2. Early on, resource traits are ludicrously broken at the moment. You can almost power your entire economy just with these leader resource traits at the very start of the game. You can quite comfortably stack up these resource traits to produce lots of consumer goods, lots of alloys, extra minerals, some energy credits, extra food to get rid of farmers, whatever you want to do right at the start of the game. Pushing back this ability, making it so your leaders must be higher levels before they can unlock this trait, is a bit of a double-edged sword, I feel, from a design perspective. So either they're going to push these traits back so far that they're pretty irrelevant, they only provide a flat resource bonus, they don't provide anything else, meaning much later in the game, that tiny amount of resources won't be worth using up your leader capacity slot, probably. But if it's too early, you end up with this overpowered situation. So I think this is a move in the right direction, but I don't think it goes far enough to address the issue that resource traits have. The devs also make a note later on that more changes to leader traits and some of the mechanics surrounding them will be coming in patch 3.9 in the fall or autumn if you're in Europe. They're placing some of the ideas and suggestions that they have received into their summer experimentation bucket 
and we'll all have to see which ones pan out. Empire size will now have a minimum floor of 50, and thus can no longer go negative. I am shocked! Shocked! Well, not that shocked. Basically, this is going to prevent us from doing a bunch of unintended things that you used to be able to do when you could get Empire Size into the negative. For example, Infinite Unity, get your dragon within 10 to 15 years because of it, you know, yada yada yada. They have increased the bombardment effectiveness of larger fleets. This means that basically bigger fleets are going to be doing more damage. I think what they've done is they've increased the cap or changed the uh, fall off for scaling of these fleets. Because previously it was such that if you had a larger fleet for every extra 100 fleet power or naval capacity you had in there, not fleet power, sorry, naval capacity, you would provide less additional bombardment damage until eventually I think the maximum was at 330% or roughly like that. This probably is going up a bit. Also, the base rate at which raiding bombardment steals pops has been dramatically reduced, thank goodness. Each army present on a planet will also protect two pops from being vulnerable to raiding bombardment. Raiding bombardment is always unable to steal the last pop of a colony. This is a really good change because raiding bombardment had been way too strong. Also now, because we're going to have two pops being protected for every army, not just defense army, all you need to do is make sure to build up some armies and you can protect all of your pops. This is, I believe, an idea that was pushed forwards, I think by one of the community members called Momonga, or it could have also been Giltanus who won my last multiplayer tournament. I can't remember for certain, I'd have to dive through my Discord to look, but I remember one of them talking about it. I passed that idea over to the devs and it's really cool, it looks like they've run with it. The next item is going to be quite a big deal for regular bio players. So if you play normal empires and you don't play hive minds or machine intelligences, this is going to be something of a nerf for you, dependent on your playstyle. So what they've done is they've normalized or renormalized political power from living standards and reduced base faction unity gain to better fit the intended unity production they want to have in the game. Additionally, the Shared Burden Civic no longer grants an increase to the base unity of the egalitarian faction as the benefit is now rolled into their living standard. So this pass has been done looking at living standards, looking at the political power specifically, and that is because it ties directly into unity generation. They have normalized them compared to one another. Living standards like Shared Burdens and Utopian Abundance were not generating enough unity, whilst Academic Privilege was previously in 3.8.3 .3, the champion of unity. Which is a little odd considering it is a materialist living standard and the intention is that spiritualists produce the most unity. After these changes, Utopian Abundance should be at the top of the charts, followed by Shared Burdens, which no longer needs the double unity from the egalitarian faction Crutch in order to still be good. These changes are of course live right now, so you can go into the game as long as you've downloaded 3.8.4 update and see exactly what each living standard now provides. Let's go through those living standards quickly just to look where things are now and then I'm going to show off a lovely little graphic made by Jern Sachs earlier which shows off exactly what the percentage changes are for this political power. Now I need to preface this. The reason that political power is important is that it directly affects the faction unity output. So in order to work out a faction's level of support which then produces unity for you it is the total of political weight that pops of that ethic have across your empire. So if a pop has a plus 900% political power, that means that they will be producing, including their 100%, 10 times as much unity if they're supporting a specific faction than a pop at 100% political power. Now, the reason this was so powerful for academic privilege was that rulers got plus 900% political power and specialists got plus 400%. They have of course received quite a heavy nerf though. It's now 600% and 250% respectively for rulers and specialists, though workers will be producing slightly more, getting plus 50%. 
The biggest winner, however, does have to be the Utopian Living Standards. Now, this one is granting plus 400% political power to all rulers, specialists, and workers. That comes at a hefty cost of one consumer good in upkeep for living standards for every pop, and if you want to get a cheaper, slightly knockoff version of this, you could go with the Shared Burdens Living Standard, which is very close at plus 300% across the board and only requires plus 0.4 consumer goods. So those two probably had the best buffs. Social welfare and decent conditions have also received something of a buff as well, getting increased specialist and worker political power which is going to be nice and very helpful if you don't want to change away from the generic living standard of decent conditions. You can also see here from the graph all of the various changes to political power weighting. Basic subsistence now gives a massive bonus of plus 950% to the ruler political weight, however, don't forget the basic subsistence cannot be put on your primary species and provide some happiness debuffs. So whilst it will be giving you a lot of political power for your rulers, that's only going to really affect alien secondary species that you find out in the galaxy, and you probably don't want to have them as your rulers anyway. So whilst there hasn't been very much written here for the balance changes, as you can see the impacts of these are going to be quite large. There's a few more to go through, so the sequential endgame crisis setting will now get plus 2 to the strength multiplier instead of plus 1.5. So if you set your crisis to all, that is the sequential setting, and you go to let's say 25 times crisis, the next crisis will be 50, and the last one should be at either 100 or 75, depending on exactly how the math shakes out there. I'm not sure entirely how it was coded, I think. It ends up at 100 times strength. That's very exciting though if it does. The Khan now has absolutely terrifying Admiral traits. I haven't gone in to check them, but I'm going to have to take the devs word for it. Hopefully that makes it more of a mid-game threat than ever before. The opinion modifier for Defender of the Galaxy will now only affect normal, non-fallen or awakened empires that are capable of independent diplomacy. So you will not be able to use this perk in order to buff up your relationship with your vassals and keep them ultra loyal. Because generally that plus 200 opinion has been better than shared burdens as long as you've got less than I think it was six vassals or seven or eight vassals, some massive number. It was pretty wild actually. Last but by no means least, colonists now increase planetary build speed by plus 10% instead of creating defensive armies. That means that you won't get additional defensive armies on your colonies at all unless you build them. So they'll be very, very vulnerable to raiding bombardment stance and regular bombardment and surrender and all of those sorts of things. That entirely does make sense from a thematic perspective though. This colony has just been set up. If you want to provide military defenses, you'll have to spend some of your resources on it. They won't actually have the infrastructure to be providing some military assistance of their own. There have been just two AI improvements apparently. They fixed the AI hiring a governor without having a planet to assign them to, and they fixed the AI hiring scientists without having science ships to assign them to. And if you're enjoying this video, please, Fix that like button. There have been a host of minor bug fixes that have fixed a few things that have been bothering people. The only example from there I'm going to draw on is they fixed randomly generated empires having DLC locked civics, randomly generated species having DLC locked traits, generated species having invalid traits and climate preference combinations, for example, a Gaia world preference on a tomb world, that sort of nonsense. Also, randomly generated species not having enough traits if it has traits such as aquatic that are required by something else. This is both good and I also kind of think bad. It was nice that you didn't need to have all of the DLC to still see some of these traits out there in the galaxy. Sure, you couldn't design your species to have them, but they would exist and you could go out and find species with some of the traits that are locked behind DLC. I think that was kind of a cool way of having a teaser for the DLC in the game, but now that will be gone. If you want to check out the rest of the bug fixes, I draw your attention where there is a link to this dev diary because in there you can find the patch notes. Next up we have the improvements category. This improvement is, I believe, a straight up nerf to the imperial government type. 
Imperial heirs are now 10 years younger than regular leaders of the same species. This is of course good, it means your Imperial heirs will live a bit longer and you will not have Imperial heirs that are the same age as your Imperial ruler and thus basically in this weird situation where you have one ruler who dies and an heir who takes their place for literally a matter of weeks and then a new heir comes in straight away basically after the second ruler has died and they'll rule for a long time and then you'll get this double up happening again. However, to balance this out, they've also made starting Imperial rulers up to 15 years older than regular leaders of the same species. This means they will die 15 years earlier. This is quite a big deal. This makes it actually quite hard, I think, for a lot of empires to keep their main leader alive long enough to get cybernetics, to get enough technology, to get leaders who are functionally immortal. And that is really bad. Your best ever ruler is always the first ruler you get for your empire because they will be guaranteed to only ever have counselor traits. And as they level up, they can only take counselor traits. So when your first ruler dies, that is a big slap in the face for the power level of your empire. Imperial heirs that benefit from bonus starting levels now have selectable traits for those levels for owners of galactic paragons. That's a nice bonus. I think that could even be considered a bug fix, in fact. Imperial rulers and heirs now have a 5% chance to start with a negative trait and an additional positive trait. The Philosopher King Civic, however, completely negates this. That also probably means Philosopher King is better than ever before because depending on what those negatives are, they could be really good. For example, you might get, oh, I don't know, minus 5% uh, build speed or 10% build speed on the planet. But if they're your ruler, it doesn't matter because they'll never be a governor on a planet. But if you get minus 5% happiness empire wide because you're tyrannical, that can really, really hurt. There have also been a bunch of UI improvements, mainly things to do with lobby chats uh, for the multiplayer sessions, having some weird overlaps, that's apparently now fixed, as well as a couple of corp related features. If you want to check that out, plus the small number of modding changes that are coming, again, check out the link in the description below, which will take you to the dev diary itself. Now, after these patch notes finish, there are a couple more notes from the developers. Amongst those is a note about habitats. A few people, edit a few question mark, have discussed the tendency of late game systems to become flooded with extreme numbers of habitats. The developers have some ideas on different ways to curb this behavior while still ensuring that habitats are thematic and effective, especially in the hands of void dwellers. Eladrin will have a broader feedback discussion later on during the summer where the developers will present some of their ideas, discuss how experiments with them went, and collect additional feedback from the community. Because of course, coming up now, we have the summer experiment. So that is a time where the developers basically, a lot of them go on holiday, especially in Scandinavia. Everybody goes on holiday for about three weeks in July. Those three weeks can differ. Usually there is some overlap so that companies still have someone around, but everybody is away. And during this time, the developers take the opportunity to work on their own ideas, their own projects within the scope of the game. Last year, we actually had the entire combat rework come out of Eladrin's summer experiments. On top of that, we also had the Ascension Path rework come out of them as well. I believe that was spearheaded by Alfrey, and I'm pretty sure that was a summer experiment too. So we could be in for some really big changes given how large the scope for previous experiments has been. Did you know that Stellaris is also going to be having a free to play weekend from June 22nd to June 26th? During that period of time, which is coming up very, very soon, you'll be able to download and play Stellaris completely for free. Because of the way that DLC is shared between all players in the game, as long as the host has them, that means you won't even need to pick up any DLC to be able to access all of the content in Stellaris, as long as you play with somebody that has all of the DLC. The Stellaris official Discord will also be hosting some learn to play Stellaris sessions. So if you'd like to join those, try Stellaris out for free, jump on into the Stellaris official Discord. 
Otherwise, the only piece of Stellaris related news I have is that I have been playing Stellaris Nexus, thank you very much to Paradox, and I have a video coming out on Friday at 5 p.m. CST, which includes gameplay and is basically a recap on one of my initial games. So watch out for that one tomorrow.